Well, good morning. Uh, on this Christmas day, the day we remember the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as many of you already know, we had many people come down with sicknesses throughout the week. And uh, I myself, uh, last night, uh, came down with some chills and and a, a small fever. And and so we just felt it safe to, to cancel our little short time together at Embassy, the gathering we were going to have. And, uh, but I did feel compelled to at least bring to you the message that I was going to share uh, concerning uh, the birth of Christ. So uh, this is the time of year that we remember the birth of Christ. And if you have your Bibles, I would ask for you to turn to uh, Luke chapter 2. And we will start reading a very familiar story concerning the promised Messiah coming into the world. So Luke 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Cornelius was governing Syria. So everyone went out to be registered, each to his own town. And then Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family line of David, King David. And he went to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. And then an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was this multitude of heavenly hosts along with the angel. And they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Now when the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and, and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after seeing them, the shepherds reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. <clears throat> the shepherds returned to their fields, glorifying and praising God for all the things they have seen and heard which were just as they had been told. Now this passage of Scripture in the Word of God is recorded here by Dr. Luke, and it's, I would say, one of the most well-known passages uh, that's known around the world, especially, of course, at Christmas time. I do fear that over many years and decades that this account of the birth of the promised Messiah of God maybe have, has become too familiar. 
and it has lost its all and glory. You know, many have made this into a very nice story as we sit around drinking eggnog with arms around our little kids, as they sit on our laps, squirming nervously, wishing we'd hurry up and read it and so they can start opening presents. But the truth is this, my dear friends. This birth is the most awaited event since God cursed the enemy of God, the serpent, in Genesis chapter 3. And let me read that. And God told the serpent in Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15. God says, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. He's talking to the serpent now. You will move on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put hostility. Here's the key. I will put hostility between you and the woman, Eve, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, the offspring of Eve, will strike your head, but you will strike his heel. <clears throat> now, as we read in Genesis, how God first held Adam accountable for allowing deception and disobedience in their midst, the very first judgment pronounced by God Almighty was on the serpent, who was used by Satan in bringing sin and disobedience into our human experience. And many times in battle throughout the history, the two sides that were fighting in the battle, one side won and one side was defeated. And in many cultures, once one king and his army won the battle, the king that was defeated was made to lie down on the ground under the foot of the king that won. Now this represented the literally the ultimate degree of humility as you might imagine. So now we read in Genesis 3 as God pronounced judgment on the serpent that he, he would move on his belly the rest of the days of his life and he will eat dust all the days of his existence and the serpent would from time forward live under the feet of humanity. And God pronounced that there would be hostility between the first woman, Eve, and the serpent, and it would be this way in every generation forward. Now, this judgment by God that her offspring, which was the Messiah, and the offspring of Satan would be in constant hostility is known in Christendom as the Proto-Evangelium, which means the pronouncement of the first good news. I mean, it's good news that at one point in the history of mankind that the promised Messiah would come and deal out a fatal blow to Satan. So the message of judgment that the serpent would only be able to strike the heel of Jesus and not his head. And this means the devil will be defeated in this struggle between Jesus Messiah and God of this world, Satan. So in reality, the world has been waiting now for Golly, a long time, friends, for the anointed one of Yahweh, the Elohim of creation, the Son of God, since the very beginning in Genesis 3. 
And to further make this point clear, allow me to read you uh, over the centuries what some prophets and patriarchs have said concerning this coming promised Messiah. In Genesis 22, God promised Abraham that all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring, not plural, singular, your offspring, because you have obeyed my command. In Numbers 24, verse 17, it says, I see him, the Messiah, but not now. I perceive him, but not near. A star will come from Jacob, and a scepter will arise from Israel, and he will smash the forehead of Moab. Numbers 24. In Isaiah 11, verse 1, it says this, Then a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Messiah, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, a, a spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And his delight, the delight of the Messiah, will be in the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11.1 1. Then the prophet Jeremiah 23 says, Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration that when I will rise up a righteous branch for David and he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. <clears throat> in Isaiah seven fourteen, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See? The virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. You know, friends, that's centuries before he was even come to earth born. So yes, the birth of the Messiah is much more than a nice story that we read once a year. It's much more than a season of baking and special food and presents and once a year family traditions. The birth of the promised Messiah of God, along with the resurrection of the Messiah of God, are the two most unique events that cannot be compared to any other event in all of human history. So that means we need to stop taking it lightly. We need to stop taking Christmas lightly and Resurrection Sunday lightly, Easter. The birth of Christ should be approached with the same glory, reverence, and fear that was displayed to the shepherds watching over their flock by night by the heavenly host. We are told in Luke chapter 2 that an angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds. Now the word for the Lord holds the meaning of a master. He's an angel of the master who exercises absolute ownership rights. He is the living God, the possessor and creator of all things. He is the sovereign king, the prince and chief of all things. This is who sent this angel to the shepherds. Obviously, it was highly important to Almighty God. 
And then we are then told that the same master, <clears throat> Yahweh, the Lord and possessor of all things, he allowed, it says in Luke 2, his glory to shine around those shepherds that night. His glory shone so bright, so much so, that we are told that the shepherds were terrified. Now, I doubt that very few in today's modern culture hold this kind of remembering the birth of Jesus in reverential fear. Rather, many of us take that glory that belongs only to the Lord and we make it just another season, a holiday of self-serving traditions, human invention, and even idol worship. And what those things do is they rob the greatest event known in human history of the glory that it alone deserves. We don't need Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny to take any spotlight that would rob any amount of glory of these two magnificent, special, great events in the history of humankind. We need to start approaching the birth of the Messiah of God as people who literally have nothing to offer God. It's all by His grace that we even have a Messiah to save us. And to add or take away anything from that is detrimental on our part as humans. The Master, the Almighty God of creation, has given what He has promised since the beginning. And as the angel stated today in the city of David, a Savior was born. The Savior, Jesus the Christ, who saves those that believe from all their sins and delivers them into his safety from the wrath of God that's coming upon this world. And as I close today, after we read this great announcement, the greatest announcement known to mankind, Luke records that suddenly, in Luke 2, 13 and 14, suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, and they were all praising God. No one else, nothing else. They were praising God and saying, glory to him in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people God favors. Today, it's commonly called Gloria in Excelsis Deo from the Latin Vulgate in the late 4th century, century version of the Bible, Latin version. And the statement means glory to God. No one else no one gets to share the spotlight with Jesus or with the Father. Glory to God in the highest. Anything added to that or taken away from that, you're in danger. And here is something you and I better understand. When we give God glory, we're not giving him something that he lacks. Rather, it's a confession of us humble creatures concerning his splendor and his glory that God already possesses as the creator and king and majesty of all things. So today, as we remember the birth of Christ, let's keep it to that. Let's stay single-eyed, as Jesus said. Keep your eyes single on the Father and on the glory that he alone is worthy of for sending his son into the world that 
whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but have eternal life. I'm sure it was hard listening to this message with my voice, but I wish you now a, a wonderful day in remembering the birth of Christ. And I'm looking forward to the new year as we gather together on January 1st. May God bless you and give you more of himself each and every day. Amen.